questions and thanks for the invitation. It's great to be back here again after four years. My talk is, as you heard, it's completely different from all the experimental applications and I myself have a little bit doubt whether you can find the applications, but you will also see some primitives or ideas which hopefully help to make the systems more stable. The global goal is more to really find ways to construct codes, then later to investigate how the codes could be performed in fault tolerance, and just to explore the landscape, what parameters of codes can we have, and in particular, how can we come up with long or big codes. The talk is largely based on joint work with Bei Zeng. Actually, the collaboration started four years ago here at QEC 07. And some of you who had looked at the program before, she wasn't invited speaker. Why is she not here? That's the reason. On Thanksgiving Day in the US, she had her second son, Jonathan, coming, and she sends regards to all the audience. Oh. <laughs> I apologize, that's completely due to me. <laughs> Not the baby. <laughs> so the main outline of my talk, I will... What we have heard already in Todd's talk, the Shaw 9-bit code is some way of concatenation. But it comes already with a particular flavor and that gives further ideas. There's another code which might be known to Many of you, a code of length 25, dimension one encoding nine qubits, how we can get to this one. I will talk a little bit about graph codes. That's also a bit to advertise. Many of you might know graph states. That became very popular. But the original by Schlingemann and Werner went far beyond that. It was really about encoding schemes, and I will address that a little bit, all in the context of concatenation. Then we will look at generalized schemes for concatenation to go beyond maybe what you find in Nielsen and Chang textbook. I hope I have time to go into the amplitude damping channel and see how their concatenation can help to get better codes and draw some conclusions. So what we have seen many times here, the short code actually is based on a bit flip code, on a phase flip code, just by encoding the qubits in different phases. But the point now is, what are the effects if you just use the bit flip code? What do the single qubit errors do? Of course, the X errors, since it's a bit flip error code, they do something to our code, but they can be corrected. It's different actually with the phase errors. The phase errors, they leave our encoded logical state zero alone, but they give a phase to our encoded one state. And independent, of course, which of the positions we act on. So the bit flip code serves actually two purposes. The one purpose is we get rid of the X errors, but additionally, we get encoded C operators in the end. So what we have on the physical level is via the error correction and the code, we convert the original channel, which could have X, Y, and C errors, we get a channel that then is only a phase error channel. And then by the next level of coding, we can use the phase flip code and we get this 913 code. The important fact, which I think is quite often not well addressed in that scheme, is not that we just have one code who would be able to correct for phase flip errors and another for bit flip errors. It's important the errors are propagated from the physical level to the first encoded level. And that's a principle we will later see for the amplitude damping channel, we can play around with that. We can use one level of encoding just to convert our channel in a channel where we better know what to do with this channel. And it's also something which was used in the fault tolerance scheme by Manny Knill. He had on the lowest level just the code for error detection, and then on the next level, he would go on really for error correction. Similar, how do we come up with the code 2519, so encoding one qubit in 25, and we can correct four errors for this code. We can start with the best known, or actually the optimal 513 code, so encoding one qubit into five, and we re-encode re each of the five qubits, and what we get is, just by the two-level a distance nine code. 
So the code lives in the subspace, in first place, of five copies of this 513 code, and therefore the stabilizer of the code, we have the five copies of the original stabilizer, kind of acting independently, but then we put further constraints according to the next level encoding. So that is, we have additionally some kind of an encoded version of the stabilizer of our original code. That is how we get the code. This also immediately kind of implies that we get a degenerate code, but that's even particular for the four tolerance scenario favorable since we have just low weight syndrome measurements and that introduces less errors. What you all should know from four tolerance, of course, if you repeat that process with a general code of distance n, just encoding one qubit, q did, if you go to higher dimensional distance, distance d, we get exponential growth, both in length and dimension, but we keep just uh, in distance, but we keep our dimension fixed. And that is something we are going to address with more general schemes that we want also to get the dimension of our code higher. Of course, maybe we have to make a compromise between the growth of the dimension and the growth of the distance, but that is something which the original constellation scheme does not really buy us. Another aspect, when we look, it was addressed in the four tolerance talk, when we just look at level decoding. So we have a code that can correct, has distance three, it can correct one error. There are two modes actually to operate this code. The one mode is that we just correct the errors, or the other mode is that we just try to detect errors. When we detect errors, we can detect two errors. But since we have distance nine for the code, we should be able to correct four errors. Now look at the two different error patterns we have here. The first one is actually only an error pattern of three, but just a single error in each of the blocks, and the other one has two errors in two of the blocks, so total weight four. So these errors, just by the parameters of the code, should be correctable. What happens if we do it separately for the levels? So if we just do error correction on both levels, then we see, okay, just a single error in each block, we can correct it, the next level doesn't see any error, all perfect. But here we have two errors in the blocks. So if we have two errors, we fail with the error correction. You say, okay, it's not too bad, error correction fails on this level, but the next level should cope with that. But again, since we fail with the error correction on this block and all block, in the next level of encoding, we have again two errors. So error correction fails, for this one, on both levels, we can not correct this error pattern if we do it separately. Conversely, if we, like in the CNIL scheme for four tolerance, would use the lowest level only for error detection, then for the first scheme, we detect three errors. But since our code is only distance three, detection of three errors means it might be an uncorrectable error pattern. So we fail for this one, however, here we have two errors, they can be detected. Now we know the position of the errors. So instead of errors, we have erasures. We can just think of that two of the blocks have been erased and a distance three code can cope with two errors at known position. So now we can correct the second pattern, but the bottom line of that is both schemes we have here, which just look individually on the levels, fail for certain error pa patterns which are guaranteed to be decodable for the complete code. So what we have to do, if we really want to do optimal decoding, we need not only just to do all the error correction parallel for all the levels, but we also have to communicate between the many levels to get to that point. So we see that there are some kind of difficulties added by these concatenated schemes, but of course, we could just treat this code as a 2513 code, ignoring the two different levels, and then we can do the correction at the expense of higher complexity. So concatenation also helps us to break down something into modular parts. 
So what does this picture look like if you go to graph codes? This is a paper together with Salman Begi, Ai Chang, Peter Shaw, and Bei Zeng, appeared in JMP this year. And before I go to that, we have to look a little bit at this graph codes and graph states. So we mind if I have a stabilizer code, we have coming with the stabilizer code logical X and C operators. And we know that, say, if we pick all the logical C operators together with the stabilizer, they all mutually commute. So this is now a maximal commuting group, and we have one particular eigenstate, a stabilizer state, which defines the encoded zero state, and then applying the logical operators to the zero state, we get our encoded basis states. You all know that, although in the tutorial, right, we can map everything in terms of a code over a finite field, and then actually the logical state just corresponds to a self-dual code, the basis states then correspond to cosets of that code. And if we have a stabilizer code, actually the union of all the cosets generate the stabilizer code, which actually he, the code C star, which denotes the dual code corresponding to the normalizer. But the important thing is for every stabilizer code, if we fix the logical operators, we always have a logical encoded state, a state we can start with. And so that is what was proposed in the original paper by Schlingemann and Werner, and then in a paper with Martin Rettler, who's in the audience, and Andreas Klapnecker. We showed actually that their proposal is nothing but a different way of presenting stabilizer. Independent Dirk Schlingemann has shown that result as well. And what we need for that to make it also operational is that we can start with a self-dual code. That is what people later look just at the name of the graph states. And we can put this into a standard form such that the stabilizer matrix has an identity part and some other part. So this identity pay part, I'm just swapping the order corresponding to Todd's talk, correspond that all of the generators of our stabilizer have a single X operator. And because the code is self-dual, we know that this matrix A is symmetric, and a symmetric matrix can be interpreted as the adjacency matrix giving the connections in a graph. But that is only just the correspondence so far to a single state, the graph state. What we want is we really want to have also the logical operators coming into that picture. And that is what was also discussed in this CWS picture, that essentially these logical operators because of the special form, become phase-only operators. So what we can do is we have to use somehow these logical operators and use k and additional input vertices to make the connection. It's very abstract. Let's go to a concrete example. We have here a Q twit code, which means that our phase gates can have different weights. They can have weight one or they can have weight two, just by indicated by these double lines. And up here, we have this standard form of the stabilizer for our encoded zero state, and this symmetric matrix corresponds to the graph with the blue vertices. Just check the labelings. But then we have also some logical operators, and since we can reduce by the normal, uh, by the stabilizer, as I said, they are C only parts, and they come into play that we have now some input vertices, and we connect them according to this one. So our graph has two types of vertices. It has some input vertices, it has some output vertices. On the blue graph, we construct the graph state. Then by these connections from the input vertices to the output vertices, kind of we do some kind of teleportation into it, since afterwards we have to do measurements of the red ones to get rid of it. And in the quantum circuit model, again, not Hideo's way of electronic circuitry, we get some kind of nice circuits. We start with Fourier transforms or Hadamard in the qubit case. 
we have just commuting mutual phase gates directly corresponding to the graph. That's actually, instead of the reference, maybe I show you rather the graph again. So just the blue graph dictates how we have these phase gates. Then we have the operators between those two additional input vertices to encode it. But at this point of the circuit, we actually have a problem. Since what we have is essentially a maximally entangled state, we have the unencoded input sitting here and the encoded input sitting there. And then essentially the techniques of measurement-based quantum computation come into play. We perform a measurement in the X basis using the Hadamard transform. And then condition on the measurement, we would have to apply certain correction operators. What is in the measurement based quantum computation? The Pauli frame. But if you want to do this coherently without the measurement, we have now to do controlled gates. And it turns out that actually those gates, they are no longer just phase gates. But nonetheless, they have, again, a nice interpretation. They are just the logical C operators corresponding to the X operators we had defined before. So we get a nice encoded circuitry. But keep in mind, we are using input vertices, K, and N output vertices. So we are using more space to do all this encoding. How does now concatenation look in that picture? For the 513 code, you can draw this pentagram just with the input vertex and the output vertices. You get a very nice picture for concatenation. You just say, OK, all of these red output vertices are encoded again in a pentagram. The catch now is this graph no longer fits into our picture, since the picture said we have k input and n output vertices. But here we have five additional vertices. We have to get rid of them. Again, the rules of measurement-based quantum computation tell us we have to measurement of them, that's the encoding rule, in the X basis and transform the graph. But the catch here is that when we do these measurements, we have to do a sequence of local complementations, picking an auxiliary node, so we have ambiguities. And we get some graph, and we want to get an interpretation how does this graph, after removing the vertices, look like. So let's look at this graph again. So we have this now zoomed in. And now we perform all, in a particular sequence, the measurements, and we get this graph. You think it's a mess? It is a mess, I agree. But this is actually a structured version of it, which I will demonstrate with a different code soon. If you just pick randomly the sequences for your local complementation for the X measurements, you wouldn't see any structure. You, you still have kind of a symmetry in that graph. And the question is how to explain that symmetry. So let's switch to a different example. If you go for the Steen code, the Steen code actually has one representation as a graph in terms of a cube. And just one of the vertices of the cube is the input, the other the output. So we have this red cube with the input sitting here and all the output vertices. We have the small cubes attached. That is also what you find in the paper about measurement-based computation and the graph states to begin with. But actually, surprisingly, nobody has looked at what happens if you perform the X measurement to that graph. How does it, at least when I ask people around, and you can actually see something, again, you see maybe a little bit more with this graph. You still see kind of the structure of the original red graph, which was connecting all of them. Now going down to the blue ones, it's becoming more busy, but we have some structure. and. The general rule is whenever you have an edge between the input and some of these auxiliary nodes, you just replace this edge by edges between the input and all the neighbors of this one which is removed. And similarly, if you have an edge between two of them, you connect every neighbor in this one with every neighbor of the one to be removed in the other one. So it's a quite a nice rule how you can get from the concatenation, having the auxiliary nodes directly to the one without the auxiliary nodes. Again, that is something avoiding the many number of qubits 
maybe at the expense of losing a little bit of the structure. Okay, let's go to how we can get more qubits into our system by concatenation. I was tempted to try to explain that also in terms of the graphs, but uh, the graphs might confuse you more at the moment. So maybe I'm trying to get more back to the original picture of the stabilizer code, which we also have seen. A stabilizer code is essentially nothing but taking the whole space and decomposing it into the code and some of the spaces which correspond to errors we can correct. So we can think of we have a new labeling of our system, the eigenvalues of our stabilizers, they label the subspaces and within, within each of the subspaces we can do encoding. So let's look for this 513 code. We have now a 32 dimension and we can get a labeling that we have just a two-dimensional subspace that is our code and many copies of that subspace. So we get 15 cop uh, total 16 copies of our two-dimensional code. Each of them would be able to correct for one error. It's just by local unitary transformations, they are related to each other. So we can define a new basis for our whole space with two quantum numbers. One number is labeling which copy of the code we have, which of the subspaces in this picture we have. And then we have kind of the second quantum number, that is the one being protected. And that gives you already kind of an idea of what we have to do. We have to somehow protect also the higher quantum number. And how we do we do this? Again, by encoding. We add another level of encoding, which just protects the number in which subspace we are. Maybe I'm just skipping that and jump to the more operational way of looking at it. So we have one quantum number entering our encoder, and this is actually telling us which of the code sets, which of the subspaces we are going into. So from the top, we have four numbers which are not protected, and we have the red label, the J, that is the protected one. And how can we get from that a better code? Of course, we replicate. So what we do is actually we take three copies of that. We somehow have to make some correlations between the quantum numbers, which we are not yet protected, and those are additional quantum labels we get for free. And if you do the analysis, it turns out that this outer code protecting this quantum number actually doesn't need to take care of hearances. You can just take a classical code. And therefore, we can just take a repetition code in that picture. And if you do the calculations in the end, which I actually had already here, what you end up by this concatenated scheme, you have a triple repetition code. Each of them has two qubits to encode, and the triple repetition code, since it's our larger alphabet, gives us 16. And overall, we get this 5, 15, 7 qubit, 3 code. It's what we already knew. So it's not a better code. But actually, because of that fact, in the joint paper with Graham Smith, Peter Shaw, John Smolin, and also Bei Zeng, we looked at the scheme and we found, actually, if you go, you start again with the 513 code, but now you take 18 bit, and then you can find a non-linear outer code, which is better than any linear code, and what, at the end of the day, you get, instead of a stabilizer code, which is, according to the bounds, the best possible, encoding 81 qubits, actually we get a code encoding 81.825 qubits. So I see a lot of people smiling. I agree. For practical reasons, you would not want to go into a fractional number of qubits. In particular, if you then go one step further, you want to do computations. What does it even mean to have a fractional number of qubits? And you cannot really do concatenation and things like that. But if you really want to test how good can we construct codes and what are the real bounds for finite size codes. Actually, we had here the Hemming bound gives us 0.918. If we do linear programming, the bound down to 0.879. And our code is actually at 0.825.
So it's getting already to this essentially 5.5% fraction of a qubit close to the bound. I don't know whether the bound is tight or sharp or whether this is already the best possible code, but we get something better. And you can play around if you go to Qtwits, the figures are getting much worse. Since now we have actually to go to a length 840 code to get an improvement, we get an improvement by 0.955 Qtwits, three dimensional systems, and now it's only 2%. Asymptotically, we get better and better, but of course, we are increasing the dimension of our systems, and this number scales very badly. With the same technique, actually, we can also get stabilizer codes. And instead of just two layers, actually, here we're going more or less in three layers. So we have just a stabilizer state that is just a new labeling of our basis. And then we group them into codes of dimension four, and distance two, and of course the whole space has only distance one. And the principle is that we now have to pair up this distance one code with a distance four code, the distance two code with a distance two code, and the distance four code just with a distance one code, since overall what the distance will be is just the minimum of the products of the minimum distances. And what we gain by that is again in dimension, and what we found is this dimension 26, dimension, uh, distance four code, and before that, my table did only show a distance three code. So with all the structure you're adding, you can find better codes, and as that you structure. Of course, you can always try to be more clever, but for the Qtwit code, to find a length 840 Qtwit code is a pain if you don't add some additional structure. Maybe I only briefly address that you can also have different codes on the lower level, and what this buys you is that you can easily get quantum codes of different lengths. In quantum mechanics, it's not, for the quantum coding, it's not so easy to come up with codes of varying lengths just by dropping some of the qubits and trading them for dimension. But if you vary the inner codes, it's quite easy, and it's actually just a classical idea we took from the IEEE transactions and transferred it to the quantum world. We also had some shorter codes, distance three, and again, we get some minor improvement. So we get 0.3 compared to the best stabilizer code, which is dimension 40, but the bound says 0.79. So in all this business of non-additive code, we can play along. But what I very briefly going to address is how this actually helped for amplitude damping channel. So this goes now back to the idea of the Shaw code or this observation that using a code on the lower level gives us an effective different channel on the higher level. And maybe to this audience, I don't need to talk much about the amplitude temp channel. So we have just a two-dimensional system where we can have a decay from the excited to the ground state with some probability and just to make our channel a complete channel, we actually get also this defacing together with it. So in particular, we have a channel that has a power meter and it does not contain identity. It's quite similar what classically is known as a C channel, where also we have only, only one state being confused with the other state, but not the other way around. But here now we have some additional, because the quantumness, the phase error, and we don't have identity. This was actually studied very early by Debbie Leung, Michael Nielsen, Ai Chang, and Yamamoto back in 97, maybe preprint was 96. And they came up with an encoding scheme for this amplitude damping channel using this particular code. And instead of using the original knill laflamme conditions, which ask kind of for perfect error correction, they're only asking for approximate error correction. We will have two talks at least in the afternoon addressing that by Cedric and, uh, so we forgot the other name, but uh, in the afternoon session we have talks on this question a bit more, but it's sufficient if you just have those conditions 
fulfilled up to certain order. That is what we call a T code, if only the higher orders vanish. And to correct for first order, they propose this code. And then there has been a lot of work, also reported by Peter Shaw. You can go to the video of last time's conference where he was talking about this amplitude damping channel. But essentially, it was always looking only for first order. And there's not much known about higher order. There's one relation known from Daniel Gottesman's thesis. If you expand everything in terms of Pauli operators, you actually see you have some asymmetry between the X and the Z hours in the end. But if you really go for the Paulis, you're asking a little bit more since you don't need correct for the excitation in damping. You only consider the damping, but not the excitation. So you're asking to correct for a bit more, but what you can find, the one thing is that this asymmetry in terms of the relation of concerning to L, and then in then Gottesman sees this quite late chapter, you find if you have a CSS code which has a certain x distance of 2t plus 1 and the c distance of t plus 1, then you actually get a t code out of it. So that's one of the benchmarks. The other benchmark is just to ignore the asymmetry and use a stabilizer code. And it turns out, with a very simple idea, on the lowest level, if you just use what we call the quantum dual rail code, you encode in 0, 1, or 1, 0. You can just think of two modes of a bean splipper or whatever. And if you apply the amplitude damping channel to this channel, uh, to those states, what you find is actually that the effective channel either leaves alone with some probability or it decays into the state zero, zero, which is orthogonal to the states we had before. So we can perform on the lowest level a measurement detecting whether we had an error or not. And just by this trick, we get effectively an erasure channel, and therefore we can just take any stabilizer code of distance d, and we get a t code, since now we know on this higher level, at the price of increasing the length by two, how we deal with these hours. And you can go to our ISIT paper or later to the transparencies, there's a lot of set of parameters, and apart from small lengths, our very naive constructions outperforms both the stabilizer codes and the asymmetric CSS codes. Since it's a very naive scheme, of course, you would expect that you could even do better, but I haven't investigated that much so far. So to conclude, the main idea of concatenation, also why it is used in fault on computation, we need in the end to get a low residual error. We have to have high distance and good codes, long codes, and concatenation is just a way to do this in a structured way. If we go for the generalized concatenation, we can gain in dimension at the price of suffering in distance, but the good thing is that the outer codes are just classical codes. We can just go to the literature about classical codes, they did not even be linear, and that is how we came up with this non-additive code out of the construction. We can also very simply use the quantum mechanical codes with different lengths. We get also this structured blockwise encoding for our big code, so we can reuse at least our pulse sequences when we have designed them. We cannot really reuse the very same device since they have to operate on different ones. And what to me the most important thing is that we can actually do an error-free transformation of channels. So we can get rid of this error here and just on one level we can transform the more physical channel into the channels which us computer scientists, mathematicians prefer to have no knowledge about the physics at all and have this layered approach and I think there is a lot of potential to use concatenation. Thank you. Questions? So does this generalized concatenation approach also work for subsystem? I don't know. I haven't looked at it yet. <laughs> Thank you.
Have you thought about using these generalized codes for magic state distillation? They might not be useful for, you know, or easy to work with for other reasons, but they might be good for that. Neither. You know, it's a, it actually, despite the fact that uh, some of the results had been published last year, essentially, or the very earliest two years ago, we have not yet spent as much time as we would like on the research of that. That's also just to invite the audience to look more at these generalized concatenation schemes. It's also the question which some of you might have. I have no clue how fault tolerance could come into play for that one. Even the decoding is a bit of mess, which was demonstrated already for the standard concatenation. You have to interplay between the levels to get the full power. Okay. Are there any further questions? If not, thank the speaker. Thank you.